the year 2012, the beginning of the end. I am Lindsay Williams, your host for this new DVD series. 2012 will be the most eventful, the most exciting, the most startling, the most unusual year in 2,000 years. Now, if you will believe what you are seeing and hearing on this DVD, you can be successful over the new world order, you can be prosperous, and you can fulfill the dreams that you have in your life despite what's going to be taking place in these years. I have with me today Rodney Balance. Rodney, welcome. I understand that you have a new title that was just given to you recently, the Father of Financial Literacy. Well, I'm, I'm very honored to have that title. I'm very thankful that uh, the owner of one of the largest financial security training companies in America, he, he called me that, and it seems to have stuck. Uh, for the main reason, Chaplain, is that I'm committed to educating people about how money works. See, my belief is that when, when, when people understand how money works, they make it work hard for them so they don't have to work so hard for their money. For the last 20 years, as you know, I've been a financial services professional offering products and services from banking industry, investments, and insurance. And I've had a great opportunity to move toward training now. So not only do I train financial professionals, I educate the public about how all these different financial tools work. And I'm really hoping now that uh, other than the, uh, through the university where I teach at Mid-Atlantic Christian University as a professor uh, on their adjunct faculty where I teach personal finance, uh, and through my books and radio interviews and television through Christian Broadcasting Network, these DVDs that you've allowed me to be a part of, I'm really hoping that we'll be able to educate people even more about how certain financial tools work so they can put them to work for them. Because of the providence of God, I had the opportunity many years ago to know things that can spare you much heartache. And that's the reason for this DVD series, because the year 2012 is going to be so significant in time that what you're going to see and hear on these DVDs, you will find it extremely helpful. My story began many years ago. I was a pastor of Grace Baptist Church in Hollywood, Florida. The Lord called me to be a missionary in Alaska after being a pastor for 12 years. And I went to Alaska as an aviation missionary. Just after arriving in the state, they announced they were going to build the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline and that 25,000 of the roughest, toughest, cussingest, drinkingest, orneriest folks on the face of the earth were going to converge on my state to build that 800-mile, four-foot diameter pipe, the largest ever constructed on the face of the earth, and they said it would be the biggest job ever undertaken by private enterprise in the history of the world. The first thing that came to my mind was 25,000 pipeliners, they must need some spiritual guidance. And having been a pastor for many years, I went to Alaska Pipeline Service Company and I said, don't you need a chaplain on the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline? Well, at first they laughed at me. I kept going back and back and back. I guess persistence paid off. So finally they said, okay, we'll give you the northern sector of the pipeline, up where the big oil field is at Prudhoe Bay on the Arctic Ocean. Just go up there and see what you can do. They said, we don't even know what to give you as a job description. I did. I'm quite sure they thought I would last a week or two. Instead, six months later, I was still there. And they came to me one day and said, Chaplain, we never knew the value of a chaplain on a pipeline before. We never had one. And we didn't have the slightest idea of your value. You've saved us thousands of dollars of counseling fees. We'd like to offer you executive status. Uh, I said, well, I'm not quite sure what that is, but if you say so, fine. They said, well, you can stay at executive dorms. When you come to Prudhoe Bay, you're welcome to stay at Arco Base. And they said, uh, we'd like to invite you to sit in on our board meetings in an advisory capacity in order to help the relationship between management and labor. I had not the slightest idea of what I was getting into. For three years' time, I lived with the elite of the world. The people you hear about in the World Bank, the IMF, top oil company officials, I sat across the dinner table from them, lived in the same dorms with them. They were not coming to my church. I was on their oil field. Therefore, they were willing to talk. 
It had to have been by the providence of God because there is no way that a little insignificant, unknown missionary flying airplanes out in the bush of Alaska could have possibly ever lived with the elite of the world for three years' time except by the providence of God. What I found out changed my life. And I'd like to say, if I can, as emphatically as I can state it, there positively is a group of people on the face of the earth who control the world. If someone had asked me when I first went to the pipeline chaplain, do you believe there's a group of people on the face of the earth who tell the president what to do and dictate what to Congress what bills to pass? I would have laughed at them. And I would have said, oh, who are you, a John Bircher? If after my three years of living with these people, someone had said to me, Chaplain Williams, do you believe there's a group of people on the face of the earth who control the price of crude oil, who control the currencies of the world, and both Russia and China, as well as tell the President of the United States of America what to do and what bills to pass, I would have said, not only do I believe it, I sat and listened to them talk about it. Now, because of that, I can say some of the things that I'm going to say today because I found out that these people have certain mindsets. They use certain buzzwords. I've written six books attempting to describe these people and the experiences that I had in order to help you understand the devious pattern of the new world order. Now, there were two of these individuals that became very close friends of mine. I think really people sometimes ask me, they say, Chaplain Williams, why do these elite of the world give you such information as they've given you over the past 35 years? And my response is, I gave three years of my life. And I think out of appreciation, these people have allowed me to know certain things. There were two of them. One of them passed away about eight, nine months ago. His name was Mr. Ken Fromm. For many years, what people wondered, is Chaplain Williams really telling the truth? Did he really live with these people? Is he really in contact with the people who behind closed doors decide everything that's going to happen in the world six months to a year, sometimes two and five years in advance? Nothing ever happens by chance. Everything is by design plan. And they know well in advance exactly what they're going to do. And there are two of these individuals who have been willing to give me information over the years. Mr. Fromm said to me, he was 87 years of age at the time. He said, Chaplain, I'm too old to care. Just go ahead and tell the world everything. Well, I have done just that. And today, I would like to tell you everything as to what is going to happen in 2012. It is so very significant. And in the course of these DVDs, you'll understand why the year 2012 is like no other year for the past 2,000 years you are going to see some of the most eventful, the most exciting, the most startling, the most unusual events. But you can live a normal life. You can be successful. And I beg of you to take to heart what you're saying and realize that the elite gave me these things. And in turn, I pass them on to you. And probably there are very few people on the face of the earth who have had the privilege by God's providence of being able to listen to these people. One of the two individuals who is the Mr. X of my book, The Energy and On Crisis, is still alive. Therefore, I will not use his, use his name out of respect and protection for his retirement. But the other gentleman passed away. I'll tell you everything he told me. As you've heard me use his name, some people said, did he really exist? Well, now you know he does. And you can even go and find out exactly who he was. Something happened about three months ago. I have not done a single radio show. As most of you know, I am on talk radio on a regular basis. In fact, sometimes I will do two and three radio talk shows per day. And I thank the Lord for the opportunity of being respected to the point of some people being willing to pull me into their confidence. But something happened. I did not do a single radio talk show for three months. Why? I'm startled. Uh, it, it's, it's difficult for me to try to explain to you, after all of these years of listening to the elite, why anything would affect me so much, but I was scared. 
I must admit, admit to you, some of the things I am saying today are very risky. But I dare to tell you because I have no choice. I have a moral obligation to let you know what they have told me. The elite have a timeline. I mean, they have certain things that they intend to do by the end of 2012. Now let's go back just a little bit so that you'll understand this. Remember the day that one of the elite said to me, Chaplain Williams, the price of crude oil is going from $137 a barrel to $50 a barrel. I dared to risk my reputation and all of the books I've written by going on talk shows across America and telling the nation, this is what's going to happen. I was laughed at. I had a very well-known financial advisor from Wall Street on a particular radio talk show that said to me, now, Chaplain, you really shouldn't say things like that. You know you could get the whole world in trouble if this really happened. Well, a few months later, he said on the same show, I apologize, you were right, it did happen, and it affected the entire world. You remember also that about, well, let's see, maybe a year, year and a half ago, I appeared on radio talk shows and I was literally trembling. At times I was afraid to say what I was saying because some radio talk show host had said to me, Chaplain, uh, is there going to be a conflict or war with Iran anytime soon? And I went to my elite friends and I said, is there going to be a, a conflict with Iran? And he came back and he said, Chaplain, no. There's not going to be any conflict with Iran, but instead I'll tell you what there is going to be. He said, there is going to be a major conflict that will begin in approximately three months in the Middle East. I dared to risk 35 years of reputation and six books reputation and go on talk shows across America and say within three months' time approximately, there is going to begin a conflict in the Middle East that will affect the entire world for years to come you remember it very well. It was first Egypt and Mubarak and the Muslim Brotherhood. And I went back to my elitist friends and I said, what are you doing this for? Why are you creating a crisis in the world? Oh, this had been planned five years. They knew exactly what was going to take place. They knew nation after nation in the Middle East that they would subvert, bring under control of a Muslim brotherhood, removing them from all freedom, and then, of course, it was Qaddafi. Now, there was a problem there. Qaddafi sent them back about three months, and from there, it was one nation in the Middle East after the other, and it took place exactly as you had heard it in the archives. It's there to prove I said it three months before it had happened, but it's not because Lindsey Williams could say it. It was because the elite made known to me a plan that they had devised four to five years prior to that behind closed doors. Folks, again, let me stress, there is no such thing as anything happening in this world that it is not planned first by the elite, and there positively is a group of people on the face of the earth who control the world. And it has happened exactly like they said it. It always will. Now, I will tell you what the elite have told me. You can, if you wish to take these things to heart, you can prosper under the new world order. I'm going to take these one at a time by subject. You'll find each one probably more startling the other uh, than the other until I come to the very end, and that, please... Don't turn off your TV. Uh, I beg of you, watch all three DVDs. The third one is going to be the most startling of all, but don't go to the third because you need the first and the second of these DVDs before you get to the third so that you'll under the back, understand the background as to how these people do what they do. So let me take these one at a time. The first subject I'd like to cover is that which oftentimes <laughs> is a very touchy subject. They say that the, that the most touchy part of a body's anatomy is the rear pocket. So let me begin, if I may, uh, where this starts. That's with the dollar. Now, some of you have heard me on radio shows 
And I made a statement that Mr. Fromm gave to me. It was back, oh, maybe three, three and a half years ago in a conversation we were having, and he said, Chaplain, if it's written on a piece of paper, it's worth the paper it's written on. Folks, please. I plead with you to examine this in every facet. I want you to think about stocks and bonds. I want you to think about IRAs and 401ks. I want you to think about notes. And please, so many of my friends have gone into the dinar. Oh, I beg of you, listen to what we're going to say. Social Security, uh, retirement funds, uh, accounts of every kind, if it's written on a piece of paper, it's worth the paper it's written on. And Rodney, I'm going to rely on you at this point. You end the business. Try to explain some of these things, if you will. Well, from a business perspective, I'd like to explain some of the financial tools that you just mentioned, such as 401k, IRA, and, and, and particularly. But I'd like to begin by just, um, I don't have to validate what you say, but in order to offer validation to the viewers, understand that I was told by Congressman Walter B. Jones, a North Carolina congressman to the United States Congress, that in the same time frame of which you speak, by 2012, our dollar is going to be worthless. I also had the privilege of knowing... Now, wait a minute. Now, am I understanding you correctly that a congressman of the United States of America made a statement directly to you yeah. that the dollar within one year will be what? Well, he said in, in 2010, he said that by 2012, or within 18 months or, or roughly, that the, uh, the dollar was going to be pretty much worthless. And, and then just in 2011, I had a United States senator. I promised him that I would not mention his name because we were, we were, just, we were having a private conversation. And he said, yes, by the end of 2012, the dollar will be worthless two United States elected officials in Washington, D.C. have said this to me. And on our website at financialleadership.co, I also have a video clip of Warren Buffett saying the exact same thing, that the, the U.S. paper dollar will be dead very soon. Now, I understand, uh, and this is startling. It, it almost <laughs> gives me chills. Uh, that's exactly what Mr. Ken Fromm told me three years ago. He said, Chaplain, the dollar will be dead by the end of 2012. Now, please, folks, I want you to hear this very carefully because you cannot misinterpret what the elite... I have learned over 35 years that I've been quoting these people to take their words exactly as they said it. Mr. Fromm did not say to me, the dollar will be non-existent. Now, please, right. note, please, note my wording. He did not say the dollar will be non-existent. He said the dollar will be dead by the end of 2012. That means that its purchasing power will have diminished to the point that it's exactly what the congressman is saying to you. Now, I also understand that he equated this to Greece. Well... I don't think that the the congressman the congressman did not equate it to Greece, uh, uh, but from from what we know in the in the I mean just those of us who are in the know understand that what's happened in Greece with the riots, the uh, austerity measures, which means cut back on government spending at all levels, and the the uproar in, in the political uproar, we know that that's coming here. Mr. Uh, Co President Nigel Farage. Freedom and democracy. Well, good morning, Mr. Van Rompuy. You've been in office for one year, and in that time, the whole edifice is beginning to crumble. Uh, there's chaos. Uh, the money's running out. I should thank you. You should perhaps be the pin-up boy of the Eurosceptic movement. But just look around this chamber this morning. Just look at these faces. Look at the fear. Look at the anger. Poor old Barroso here looks like he's seen a ghost. You know, they're beginning to understand that the game is up. And yet, in their desperation to preserve their dream, they want to remove any remaining traces of democracy from the system. And it's pretty clear that none of you have learned anything 
you know when you yourself mr van rompuy say that the euro has brought us stability i suppose i could applaud you for having a sense of humour but is this not really just the bunker mentality? you know your fanaticism is out in the open you talked about the fact that it was a lie to believe that the nation state could exist in a 21st century globalised world. Well, that may be true in the case of Belgium, who haven't had a government for six months, but for the rest of us, right across every member state in this union, and perhaps this is why we see the fear in the faces, increasingly people are saying, we don't want that flag, we don't want the anthem, we don't want this political class, we want the whole thing consigned to the dustbin of history. And we had the Greek tragedy earlier on this year and now we have the situation in Ireland. Now I know that the stupidity and greed of Irish politicians has a lot to do with this. They should never ever have joined the Euro. They suffered with low interest rates, a false boom and a massive bust. But look at your response to them. What they're being told as their government's collapsing is that it would be inappropriate for them to have a general election. In fact Commissioner Wren here said they had to agree their budget first before they'd be allowed to have a general election. Just who the hell do you think you people are? You are very, very dangerous people indeed. Your obsession with creating this Euro state means that you're happy to destroy democracy. You appear to be happy for millions and millions of people to be unemployed and to be poor. Untold millions must suffer so that your Euro dream can continue. Well, it won't work because it's Portugal next with their debt levels of 325% of GDP, they're the next ones on the list. And after that, I suspect it'll be Spain. And the bailout for Spain would be seven times the size of Ireland. And at that moment, all of the bailout money has gone. There won't be any more. But it's even more serious than economics. Because if you rob people of their identity, if you rob them of their democracy, then all they are left with is nationalism and violence. I can only hope and pray that the Euro project is destroyed by the markets before that really happens. Thank you. Because just like we can predict the weather, knowing what's coming from the west to the east in the United States, if we see a thunderstorm coming, we know if it's coming from the west to the east, it's coming our way. And it, the political climate, or the, I'm sorry, the economic climate transfers from the east to the west. So when, what happened in Japan 20 years ago, with their economic downfall has been slowly working its way to the United States across the Middle East across the Europe and now into the United States as you see um, days of rage across the Middle East and, and in Europe and now in, in, uh, in 2011 it happened in Washington and in New York these days of rage are orchestrated orchestrated by organizations such as the Muslim Brotherhood labor unions and other organizations who, who exist solely for the purpose of disturbing the normal cycle of life for Americans or for any, or any, any country. So when these people are, are purposefully demonstrating, oftentimes violence occurs when they're the ones who are going to be on the, uh, on the downside of any type of economic change. That's why I teach financial leadership, Chaplain, because management assumes things will stay the same. Money management is what's been taught for, forever, and it's a, it assumes things will stay the same, and it's a reactive approach to finances. I teach financial leadership, and this is why I've gotten the, the title, The Father of Financial Literacy, because I want people to understand how to be proactive in their teaching, or in their understanding, in their actions. When they're proactive, and they take a proactive approach to their finances, they can anticipate change. Sometimes they can initiate change, but they will always benefit from change. So when, a while ago, when you mentioned 401ks and IRAs and such, my advice to our viewers, and I need, to, I need to stress this extremely clearly, if you have a 401k account, if you have an IRA, an individual retirement account, and these things are in mutual funds, please, please do yourself a favor, get out of those mutual funds immediately, immediately. Because these mutual funds are the first to react negatively to any type of economic pressure. Secondly, mutual funds are a timeshare approach to investing. 
For example, I shared this with you at the dinner table the other night about the difference between someone wanting to have a home at the beach in a, in a resort area, for example, and, and they wanted to have that place there anytime they wanted to go. You have two choices, basically. You can, you can buy a home there, and you can go there anytime you want to. You can rent it out for income, or you can sell it for a, for a substantial return later. Or you can go down the road and get a timeshare. Okay? Uh, now, timeshare is a great vacation alternative for millions of people. Don't mean to not timeshare, but you need to understand that timeshare in and of itself means that you rent, you own uh, one week in one room of the hundreds or thousands that there are in that complex. That's the way uh, the difference between mutual funds and owning stocks is. The stock is you've, owned, you've made a complete commitment to owning that piece of property. You own a share of stock. That share of stock will produce dividends for you. You can reinvest those dividends and it will buy more stock in that particular company. You can, you, you can take dividends as a quarterly payout and it will produce income for you. Or you can sell it and it will produce a revenue, uh, a one-time revenue. Mutual funds, on the other hand, are made up of, for example, let's take the growth funds of America. It's made up of 600 different stocks. Now, you may have Apple stock in, in there, okay? It is, it's part of the portfolio. Apple stock may pay 70 cents dividends. If you own, if you have uh, $100 invested in that mutual fund, let's say you own one one-hundredth of one share of Apple stock. Well, at 70 cents dividend per share, that means you may receive a dividend of 0.7 cents per quarter. That's eat up, eaten up in, in fees and uh, administrative costs and things like that. It, it, it dramatically reduces your ability to earn any type of return on your, on your money. Mutual funds in and of themselves are a, a major, major volatile tool. And you'll never get wealthy owning mutual funds, for example. And I, I'm talking so much about mutual funds because so many people have them that make up their IRA and their 401k. That's the financial tool that makes it to where they're going to have retirement money when they need it. So I'm spending a lot of time explaining this to hopefully under, help you, the viewer, understand why you've got to get out of these things. Because the 401k, for example, w before 1980, when, when 401k was introduced as a primary retirement planning vehicle, Ted Benna was hired by a bank, to a large bank, to get them out of the retirement or pension plan business so that they would not have to pay pensions to employees 20, 30 years out. Well, he found this little loophole in the IRS code of section 401, subchapter K, which allowed for high wage earners to defer a bit of their earnings tax-wise so that they wouldn't have to pay taxes on it up front. He said in a Time magazine interview in 1981 that he knew right away this would not be advantageous to the blue-collar, everyday American worker unless the employer matched those contributions. My friends, if your employer is not matching your contributions in that 401, first off, get out right away. You know, don't, don't contribute another dime. But you've got to understand the danger that these 401Ks, these IRAs, anything tied to the stock market today that is sold to you by a bank or an investment firm, you need to get out of these things. There may be some opportunities in some stock to own some particular stocks that may be advantageous to you in the long run. And everyone, you've got to take heed because some paper will only be worth what it's, the paper is written on, like you say. If it's written on a piece of paper, it's worth the paper it's written on. And there is one currency, quite interesting, throughout all of history. There is one currency that has never gone to zero. It's found in Genesis chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, the first metal ever mentioned in the Bible. Now, being a person who has studied the Bible all of my life, I'm 75 years of age, I've been a minister of the gospel for over 50 years, and I know a first mention principle in the scriptures. The first time that something is mentioned, it'll always have that same meaning throughout all of the rest of the scriptures. And in Genesis chapter 2 it is, Verse 11 and 12, it mentions the first metal ever mentioned in the Bible. It's gold, and it says it's good. Abraham used it. Moses used it. The kings of the nations have used it. Mr. Fromm said to me back a number of years ago, 
He said, Chaplain, there's only one way that you're going to spare your assets. I have it. Same thing Abraham and Moses and kings have used. And Mr. Fromm said to me one day when I was utterly at my wit's end, and I said, Ken, how can I possibly spare my family heartache? How can I save my dinner table? And he said to me, he said, Chaplain, the currency of the elite is gold and silver. And he said, it is the only thing that will maintain its value when paper becomes worthless. The dollar will be dead by the end of 2012. I did not say non-existent. I said dead. Why? It can be printed. That's the only difference in gold and silver and the paper dollar. It can be printed. Three years ago, I begged. I pleaded. I, I went on radio shows all across America. I, I was on George Norrie and Coast to Coast. I was on Alex Jones. I was on Dr. Stan Monteith. I was on many radio shows all across this nation. And, and I begged them. I said, please. Go out and buy every piece of gold you can get your hands on. At that time, you could buy gold for $600 an ounce. I said, it is the only thing whereby you are going to be able to maintain your purchasing power. Now, let's do some arithmetic. Three times 600, which you could have bought it for at the time that Mr. Fromm told me that this is the currency of the elite. He said, Chaplain, nothing's going to happen to that. Now, oh yeah, it may go down a little bit, and it may go back up a little bit, and you'll get scared when it goes down. <laughs> Don't let it bother you. That's all the process uh, of what's happening out there. Now, let's do some math. Three times six is eighteen. Eighteen hundred dollars in three years' time, your gold purchases have increased. What has happened to your paper? Now, come on, be honest with me. Uh, all of those paper accounts, even your bank account, you're getting any interest? Uh, quite interesting. Uh, I have to bring up a prop here. I had a very interesting letter sent to me just recently. Uh, they sent it to our uh, fulfillment house out in Kansas, and it says, Dear Reverend Williams, I do want to thank you for sharing uh, your faith. But he said also for sharing what's going on. Because of your information, I have experienced some gains on the purchases I made in preparations for the future. He says, please accept the enclosed, and what did he enclose? One dollar, I'm sorry, a one ounce, a one ounce gold coin. He said, please accept this as my appreciation for the information you gave me. Now, uh, the other day, that was worth $1,800, that one ounce gold coin. And he said, accept it as my appreciation. And he puts a scripture at the bottom, 1 Timothy 5.18, the laborer is worthy of his hire. And he said, I, I want to send you this out of appreciation for making me a small fortune. He must have invested very heavily in gold. And when he did, he now is three times six, eighteen hundred dollars an ounce. Where is it going? I'll tell you. Oh, I know you, you're a little afraid at times when you see it go down, aren't you? But uh, don't be afraid at all. Watch where it's going. Gold is going to $3,000 an ounce plus. Now, I'm very conservative there. I know some people have said much, much higher. It will go to $3,000 an ounce. You're going to see silver go to $50 to $75 an ounce, and you're going to see it because they will back the new world currency. How do I know this? You remember at the beginning of this presentation, I said I would try to inform you as to what the elite have told me so that you can spare your dinner table, so that you can live a very normal life through the New World Order program 
that already is planned as in, and is in store for you and certain timelines that they have by the end of 2012, you do not have to lose sleep at night. You do not need to look behind bushes everywhere you go. Listen to what is said in this DVD, what the elite have told me. You can spare yourself heartache. And if you will just take a few precautionary measures, there is no reason whatsoever for you to have to suffer through these times that are coming up. There will be a new currency. The new currency, I have been told, will be backed by gold and silver. In order for the World Bank, the IMF, the New World Order to have a new currency, they must take gold to $3,000 an ounce in order to be able to back it by gold because of the amount of gold that's on the face of the earth. Now, if you want to save yourself a lot of heartache, you know where your paper is going. Watch out. No matter what it may be, if it's written on a piece of paper, it's worth the paper it's written on. had quite an experience here a few weeks ago. It so happened that the family and I uh, went to the state of Oregon. Uh, we have a friend there who owns a very large wheat farm. In fact, I think he has about 3,000 acres of wheat, plus greenhouses, plus... Uh, many other uh, groves of every kind from apples to pears to oil, every kind of magical. And while there, I just wanted to be out away from everything. I, I just wanted to get away for a while, and I really didn't care that anybody knew I was there. But I guess the word got around, and one night I was standing just outside the house, right near the entrance to the farm driveway, and one of their big tandem tractor trailer, 18-wheeler. I saw him pull out from the dock. They were coming in and out uh, of the farm on a regular basis every uh, numbers of times per day, and I didn't pay too much attention to it. But I was standing outside. It was a beautiful starry night, and the moon was shining, and it was nighttime. I didn't think anybody would see me standing out there beside the road just watching all the beauty of the skies with no city around, no city lights. And uh, uh, this big 18-wheeler, uh, started down the road, and as he did, he got right to where the place that I was staying was on the farm, and he stopped his wheel, his truck. And I thought, well, this ought to be interesting. I'll watch this truck driver make an inspection before he gets out on the road. And in a moment or two, he walks around the truck, didn't say a word to me. He walked up to me, gave me a great big bear hug, I mean, I thought he was almost going to break some things apart. And he said, Chaplain, I hope I'm not invading on your privacy. He said, please forgive me. He said, I heard you were here. I've heard you on radio talk shows. He said, you've always told me everything right. He said, you told me what the elite were going to do ahead of time. He said, you told me a few years ago that I should be investing in gold and silver. He said, now I'm headed to Las Vegas. I'll be with my girlfriend this weekend. <laughs> I hope you heard the salvation part of my message also. And he said, uh, while I'm over there, he said, I just want to tell you. He said, between the two of us now, because of your advice given three years ago, he said, we have over $1 million. Because he said that gold has gone up in value so much. He said, I just wanted to stop my big 16-wheeler long enough to say thank you and appreciation for telling me what you did. Now, folks, I hope by the end of 2012, that you will say, Lindsay Williams, I'm so glad that you told me what you did because I spared my dinner table. I helped my family be able to live and maintain a lifestyle while my neighbors were losing their houses and they were going broke. Now, you've just begin, begun to hear what, what we have to say about all of this. And I'd like to use an illustration, if I can, uh, a simple pencil and a dollar bill. Uh, let's say that you want to buy a pencil, and there's only one dollar available to buy that pencil with. So the store is going to sell you that pencil for that dollar. Now, you have the ability to print two of these dollars. As the printing presses of the Federal Reserve are doing right now. So now you go back to the store 
and you say, I'd like to buy a pencil. And he says, well, they just printed some more of them, so now it takes two of these to buy one of these. Now, that's what is known as inflation. That's what's going to happen between now and the end of 2012. The Federal Reserve has turned up the printing presses. Now, there is a solution. To each of the items that I'm going to give you, I will also give a solution. The solution of money, you must get into something tangible that can spare your house the heartache and the suffering that will be the result of the elite's control. Now remember, the name of the game is control. They really don't want to own everything, they just want to control everything. Uh, they want you to fail to pay your house mortgage so in turn that they can turn around and rent it back to you after the new world order has diminished the currency and issued their new currency. So let's go then to a second point. As I said, I would take these one at a time. The next one is debt. I plead with you, don't get involved. It's a trap. Rodney, I'm going to have to lean on you a little bit here. Debt's a trap. I've been told even by the elite that they wish to put the world in so much debt that every country, every state, every city, every individual, every corporation will be so much in debt before they allow a total collapse that they can basically own everything. This is their end goal. So tell us a little bit about the debt trap. Well, let me begin back in 1819. A gentleman named Nathaniel Rothschild was addressing the British Parliament, and he said, I care not what figurehead sits on the throne of England. The man who controls England's debt controls England, and I control that debt. Now let's move ahead to 1971. When President Nixon took us off the gold standard, what, uh, what was the standard that we took up after the gold standard? We took up the debt standard following the path of those nations from the east. Once again, that economic climate moves from east to west. The European debt situation came to us. So we put us, it put us on the debt standard. Um, since then, many of us have developed systems for our finances, for our family's finances and things. And uh, unfortunately, we have adopted that debt standard right through our daily lives incorporating what I refer to as the monthly payment system. You know, it, we no longer work off of a profit system for our families where we can turn what we have into more to benefit us. We now look and say, well, we have X number of dollars left. We can afford another monthly payment for whatever it might be. And that philosophy has trickled down through our government to our families and has all but ruined our financial future as we look at it because debtors are controlled by a creditor uh, debtors are controlled by the creditors you know the man who controls the debt controls the nation or the family it scares me to think of what people don't know <laughs> I, I know that sounds rather strange but it frightens me to think of what people do not know and Something I noticed, I mentioned earlier in the DVD presentation that I did not do a single radio show for about three months because I was scared. With what I saw and what I heard, it frightened me to no end. Uh, I learned a number of months ago that there is major discord and disagreement amongst the elite right now. Now, I go back to the Bible also for this. Because in the book of Daniel, you remember that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had a dream. And he saw a horrifying looking image, head of gold, breast of silver, but all the way down to the feet. And the feet of all things, which should be the strongest because that's what the entire image stands on, the feet were iron mixed with clay. That's exactly where the elite are right now. There is discord, there is disagreement, 
There is confusion amongst the elite themselves. I learned this many years ago when I lived with these people for three years. They don't, they're not really in love with each other. Uh, they stick together solely for the purpose of being able to accomplish their own devious plans, but they'd cut each other's throat in a minute's time. And right now, there is iron mixed with clay, exactly as God's holy word said there would be amongst the elite. And it frightens me to think because, well, let me put it this way. Old men talk. Let me try to explain it if I can. My first elitist friend who has been giving me information for so many years, just before he died, he said, Chaplain, I'm too old to care. Just tell the world everything. My present elitist friend is telling me a lot of things. I'd like you to consider a few things that they know. and You need to give some consideration to them also concerning this year of 2012 and the debt crisis that we're in. Number one, now I, I don't place any credence necessarily in this, but at least you need to consider it. That was a syllabization at one time by the name of the Mayans. They were very advanced in their knowledge. They created a time clock and a calendar that has never been equaled on the face of the earth. But yet they didn't have all modern day investments. The Mayans have a calendar that goes through December the 21st, 2012. Now, there's a reason for that. And they said at that point, a new era begins. Well, the elite know something also. They know at this point what the debt clock looks like. And they have a timetable for which they are going to see to it that the entire world is in such massive debt. Let me try to explain it by coming down to your house. Uh, your house, you have a mortgage. Well, I hope you don't, but if you do. Uh, oh, by, by the way, my suggestion is, even if you have to go to a log cabin, you get a paid for a roof over your head right now, uh, you, you're going to need it when the end of 2012 comes around. But at least for right now, let's say that you have a mortgage on that house. When the dollar, the reserve currency of the world, uh, when the elite take it to where they say they're going to take it by the end of 2012, you will not have the currency necessary to be able to pay off your house mortgage. And when you can't make that payment because you've lost your job, the economy becomes worse than what it is right now, they will come in and repossess your house and turn around and either rent it back to you or the name of the game is control. Now, this same scenario is what the elite have told me that they have planned by the end of 2012 for every nation. I hope you heard this. Every nation of the world, including the United States of America, with its trillions of dollars of debt and approximately 1.5 to 2 trillion per year of new debt that we are chalking up per year, they want every corporation, every individual, they want every state, they want every city to be so much in debt that when the dollar collapses, the reserve currency of the world, there is nothing that anybody can do about it and basically the elite will have accomplished what they want, and that is the name of the game is control. Whether it be your house payment, whether it be your automobile, whether it be your federal government. Oh, by the way, I, I need to inject something here that you'll find in the future. You'll come back and say you heard it first from Lindsay Williams. Lindsay Williams first heard it from the elite. Here it is. America will default on its national debt. Did you hear that? Yes. It is already planned. It will grow so great. America will default on its national debt. Watch. Here it is right here. Listen, if you will, as Glenn Beck tells it to you. Billions of dollars. This is how much money do we print and have in the system at any given time? Let me start in 1929. Show me the... Here we go. 1929, here's the stock market crash, all right? Now, if you see, we just, we were on the gold standard, so we couldn't print much more money. We had the stock market crash, but we didn't do all of the stuff that we're doing now, just printing money. Go ahead, step to the next thing. 
Then we go up to 1941. That's the Great Depression. Still haven't pumped a lot of money into the system because, again, on the gold standard. Then we have World War II, and we'll take this all the way to 1965. You'll see it comes up. We had two wars. We had World War II, and we also had the Korean War. In 1965, we were having the Vietnam War, but here's where it gets sticky because we had all these wars, and we tried to dogpile on with the Great, uh, the great Society. Well, how are we going to pay for all that? Well, 1971, Richard Nixon says, why don't we get rid of the gold standard? So that way, we can just print whatever we want. But we promise the rest of the world, oh, no, we'll never print too much. Really, we're good for it. I mean, look at our record here. We don't do that. Great society kicks in, and look what happens. Next point, please. Look how we've devalued our money. This is up until 2000 when we have the Y2K scare, where everybody's like, bury your food and grab your cash. The computers are going down. That's why the government put this little spike here. If you see that little spike, goes up because they just dump a lot of cash into it, and then they bring it back in, they pull it back in. But it's difficult to pull things back in, especially when you have a horrible event like 9-11. Next stop is 9-11. You'll see it's just a little spike back up, just a little bit. Remember how everybody was freaked out that the world was coming to an end? Do your patriotic duty. Go spend. Go out there and, and get into the stock market. Well, we did. And then... This is the kind of spending we get. As you see here, the federal bailout's just about to begin. We're in, let me get into my Al Gore machine. Oh, it's a real inconvenient truth now, isn't it, Al? Look at this hockey stick. This is the hockey stick that Al Gore was talking about with the, you know, the woolly mammoth coming back or whatever the hell he's talking about. Here's where we were in September last year. But then the Treasury decided we need to start printing more money. This hockey sh stick should take your breath away. This is devaluing our money. You know, Al Gore said global warming is not a political issue, it's a moral one. Thomas Jefferson said doing this to our children is immoral. And I agree with him. We have pumped all of this money in and devalued our money. How is it not going to be worthless? This has never, ever been done by anybody ever before. Please, share this video with everybody you know, all your friends. Please go to foxnews.com slash Glenn Beck. We're going to make this available for you. Pass it on to your friends. This is real trouble. Not in a thousand years. Perhaps in the next year. To you. Now, let's go to Europe. Europe is in big trouble. Rodney, I'd like to lean on you for a moment if I can. What's happening over there in Europe? There's some very disturbing things that's affecting our whole financial system here in America. Well, absolutely. You see the, uh, the troubles in Greece. Uh, well, let's call it the pigs, like they're referred to in, in our circles. Uh, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. These are the countries that are in most dire economic trouble. And these are the countries that are realizing the most challenge in keeping their system afloat. But these are also countries that have focused on a socialistic style of government, whereas the government takes care of all of the people. People are allowed to retire at age 50 with a lifetime income similar to what they had while they were working. And you can't, that's an unsustainable business model, and it's just not, not able to work, as we've seen in our own Social Security system, we'll talk about after a while. But when, when these things become when the debt becomes greater than your ability to repay, you have to either default on that ability to repay or possibly devalue your currency in a way that you're paying back with currency that is less valuable than what you borrowed. And that's, that's what we see a lot of. Now, you remember back in 2008, there was a bank called Lehman Brothers failed? Yes. Lehman Brothers, it put the entire United States economic system in a tailspin. All of the banks were scrambling. The federal government uh, issued what we now know as TARP, which was a program designed to bail out these banks. People were up in, up, you know, just in an uproar, uh, uh, aggravated, upset that this had happened. One thing that they don't understand, Chaplin, is if the government had not stepped in and created TARP, all the money they had in their 401ks, their IRAs, and, and mutual funds would have been evaporated. As it was, a lot of people lost 40, 50, 60, even 70% of the value of their mutual funds. But 
well, just let me just inter interject here. Not one of my clients lost a single penny during that time because I warned them about this situation. We got them out of those volatile tools. But what's happening is Greece is becoming like Lehman Brothers on the global economic scale. So as you see what happened in the United States with one major bank failing, now you're about to see it or are, or are seeing it with a nation that's defaulting on its debt. And it's going to be allowed to fail. And the entire economic system as we've known it globally is going to experience what the United States experienced in 2008 and 2009. Are you ready for that? Are, are, is your financial situation ready for a multiple of what you experienced in 2008 and 2009? What we now know is the Great Recession. This new Great Recession or this new Great Depression, whichever it may become, could absolutely devastate your family's finances. I'm asking you right now, I'm telling you, move your money. If you're not sure how to do it, contact us at the Financial Leadership Academy. We'll help you. We'll help you understand how. We're not going to do it for you, but we'll help you understand how to do it. And, and, and that's so important is we educate people. The most precious gift in the world right now, Pastor, and you share it all the time, and I'm thankful that I can too, is knowledge. The most precious commodity on earth right now isn't gold or silver or paper dollars or real estate. It is knowledge because if you possess the knowledge and the information of what's about to happen, you can use those other tools I just shared with you to prepare yourself for those things. You do not need to suffer. Can I say it any more emphatically? There is no reason for you to lack on your dinner table. If you will listen to what the elite have told me, if you will listen to the advice of a successful financial planner, now you'll find his email address and his phone number at the end of our first DVD. I suggest that you get educated. You do not have to suffer. And please, I beg of you, if you do not have it, I urge you to get our previous DVD series entitled The Middle East, The Rest of the Story. Three hours of DVD viewing telling you why things are happening in the Middle East. You see, all of this was planned. They wanted the Muslim Brotherhood to take over one Arab country after the other until they made the oil supply of the world so diminished to the point that they could take the price of oil. Oh, I know, price of oil may be down for a little while, but it's going back up. The price of gold and silver may have dropped a little bit for a period of time. You haven't seen anything yet. You just wait till it gets where the elite want it, and you're going to see it go, as we mentioned earlier, an exact price. I beg of you, educate yourself, learn the facts. And when you do, you will not have to suffer what Greece has suffered. You won't have to join the people protesting in Washington, D.C. and downtown Wall Street because you have lost all of your savings. You don't have to suffer that. If you will only listen and take action yesterday, <laughs> folks, I hope you heard that. I didn't say tomorrow. Don't even wait till tomorrow morning. If you'll take action immediately, you can spare yourself the heartache of the things that the elite have planned. Now, they plan for every state, every county, every city. Please, you need to hear it. I don't think anybody puts it quite as well as Eric and J.J. They really, the states have swept under the rug, ladies and gentlemen, and it's, the chickens are all coming home to roost because... They can no longer hide the losses at the state level. Rhode Island, the nation's smallest state, but it may have the biggest pension problem in the country, maybe the largest in the land. The state's on the hook for billions of dollars worth of pension benefits owed to police officers, firefighters, teachers, judges, and state workers. But the money is simply not there. Projected investment gains never happened. Wall Street went in, put these guys in debt. They kept giving them raises, raises, raises. If you had Dow 70,000 right now, Rhode Island would be able to pay. They just can't. The money's just not there. The gains never happened, and the state actuarial projections failed to keep up with the public workers who are retiring earlier and living longer. 
Estimates, get this. This is how bad it really is. This is what they don't tell you. Estimates put Rhode Island's unfunded liability for the public workers' pensions at $7 billion, or what their entire state budget is for one year. That's just for the pension? Just for the pensions. Every penny goes if, if you don't have anybody who's currently working or you don't fix fire it. Fire everybody. Fire everybody. Do not do anything. Shut down City Hall. Still collect the same amount of taxes. Every pension goes out. Every penny goes out to the pensioners. Wow. To make good on promises to public workers, the states now must pour more and more into the pension system every year. From $319 million in 2011 to $765 million in 2015 to $1.3 billion in 2028. Several states, including Ohio, Illinois, and California, face even larger unfunded pension costs. But when Rhode Island's cost is divided amongst its 1 million residents, it becomes clear that they have the biggest cost per capita in the nation. All the private people got to pay for the people who are not working. We go back and forth. Same thing, Social Security. That's the same thing that's happening, ladies and gentlemen. All this Ponzi scheme stuff and all this, based on all these rosy projections and these quote-unquote financial planners. Now, let me ask you, had they not bought mutual funds and, and Rhode Island would have invested in gold when the millennium rolled over? You think they'd be able to honor their they, Actually, yeah, they'd be okay. You needed about 10% return a year, every year, minimum. Now, I don't know about Rhode Island. I know California, that's what they needed. Rhode Island maybe needed 20% return, but they didn't get them. Banks, lending institutions, Social Security, you need to be prepared for the inevitable. And Rodney, I tell people that the elite have even let me know that people can spare themselves heartache. What would your suggestion be in light of what we believe the elite are trying to tell us. Well, as we said a while ago, information is key. Knowledge and understanding about how certain financial tools work is precious. And uh, can I interject? Uh, I don't mean to be self-serving here or a little commercial, but so many people are turning to DVDs by entertainers talking about financial tools, promoting a 15-year mortgage over a 30-year mortgage and how to buy term life insurance and invest the rest in, in mutual funds. Folks, there is an alternative to those type of, uh, of programs that are being flooded in churches today. We have produced a five-week program based on actual financial knowledge, and we want to present that to your church for free. So if your church or organization is considering buying one of these DVD, these 13-week uh, so-called uh, do-it-yourself financial programs, Consider ours, which is produced by a professor at a university teaching personal finance and a 20-year veteran of the financial services industry. As I share with you inside information about how these tools work and how they're marketed in a way to take, separate you from your money, I'll share with you how the different financial tools work and, and how the right mortgage may not be what might be widely accepted. I appreciate you giving me that, but, but folks, honestly, the best way to prepare yourself is to listen to someone who's trying to serve you and not someone who's just trying to sell a program. We're giving it for free to churches. So contact us at financialleadership.co and see how you can get it in your community and get competent knowledge and prepare yourself for what we all know is about to happen. My dad was very wealthy at one time. It was back in the 1920s, and 1929 came around, the Great Depression. He had made a fortune and was very wealthy selling land and houses in Florida. He was a masterful salesman. He could have easily sold freezers to Eskimos. He was just that kind of a person. And he had done well, but he had invested all of his savings in paper. What kind of paper? Coral Gables, Florida. Yes, the city's still there. But in 1929, when the Great Depression took place and people stopped buying houses and lands in Florida, 
Carl Gables Corporation declared bankruptcy. Oh, you say a city can't declare bankruptcy. Oh, come on now, tell me, Pastor Williams. You mean to tell me that a state or the federal government would declare bankruptcy? Sure they can. Just like an individual can. Well, they did. Carl Gables, Florida declared bankruptcy and just with a stroke of a pen, my daddy went from wealth to pauper. I mean, instantaneously. Lost everything he had. It was all in Carl Gables' bonds. And Carl Gables Corporation, Carl Gables City, declared bankruptcy in 1929. I hope you're listening, folks. You don't have to suffer that. There are other ways for you to survive. And again, I'd like to go back and say, you won't have to protest with all of the others on Wall Street or in Washington because you'll be protected and your assets, uh, whenever it comes around to it, you can live a normal life through the new world order until they come to their end. And you'll find out in a few moments how the new world order is going to come to its end also. I know that. Oh, yes. I've never given this in any DVD. In fact, I've never given it on any radio show. This has never been heard anywhere. What you're going to hear in just a few moments as to when the elite are going to become, get to their end. Yes, they are. I'll even tell you when. First of all, I'd like to give you America's greatest danger. Mr. Fromm gave me this before he died. He said to me one day on the telephone, he said, Chaplain, China is the big one. I need to make a statement here that it's going to startle you. America's greatest danger today is China. Oh, yes. Not North Korea, not Iraq, not Iran. Not Afghanistan. Oh, Afghanistan's a problem. I understand that something in the neighborhood of 87% of the world's opium comes out of Afghanistan. By the way, just in passing, has anyone in Congress or anyone, our president or anybody else in the United States of America, has anybody in government ever told you why we are in Afghanistan? Have they ever even been willing to answer the question as to why we're there? It's very simple. I'm sure you agree between the lines. 87% of the world's opium comes out of Afghanistan. We're there to protect the interests of certain people. Oh, I won't stay on that subject any longer. We'll, we'll just pass that one. What is our greatest danger? The greatest danger in the United States of America, the greatest threat to the United States of America today, China holds approximately $3 trillion worth of our Federal Reserve issues. Can you imagine Walmart without a single product on the shelf marked made in China? Can you imagine what China is going to do when the United States of America defaults on its national debt? And we will. What will happen? Uh, jobs? Where have we taken them? We've taken our jobs in America. Free trade. First of all, free trade is not free. No, you've lost your job. Thousands of Americans are out of job while Caterpillar took their business and Boeing took their plants and the, the, the great industries of America and the auto industry included have taken their plants to China and you've lost your job. You call that free trade when you lost your job? How about trade? First of all, it's not free. Secondly, it's not trade. We buy from China. China buys a pittance from us. <laughs> you want to find out? Just see how many people lost their jobs because we don't sell our products any longer. What have we gotten into? We've gotten into one of the most drastic situations that any nation on the face of the earth they've ever had. Let's just take, for instance, two of the biggies that have moved to China. Caterpillar and Boeing Corporation. Do you realize that according to Chinese rule or authority or communism, however you'd like to call it, uh, 
according to Chinese rules, if an American corporation moves to their country, they must have a Chinese partner, and they must give to that Chinese partner all of their patents and, 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 and all of the secrets of their product. Do you realize that Boeing Aircraft has given all of the knowledge of that technology to China in order to be able to get in for cheap labor? Do you realize that Caterpillar now is regretting, <laughs> they won't admit it until a few years from now, they're regretting the day they ever went to China because now their partner has taken their patents and all of their right, all of their secret trades uh, items that's made Caterpillar so famous and they are making Caterpillar products now in competition to Caterpillar and selling them all over the world out of China and you call this free trade? Our greatest danger today to the United States of America and Mr. Fromm told it to me before he ever died. He said China is the big one. Watch them. He said the Federal Reserve he said, Chaplain, please note this carefully. He said, the day that the Federal Reserve begins to buy back its own securities, it's all over. They began this a while back. First of all, it's not Fed. It's not federal any more than Federal Express is. And secondly, there is no reserve. You think that piece of paper that you call a $1 bill has a reserve? Quite to the contrary. It's not fed, and it's not reserved, and it is not a part of the United States government. They will rent you back, the elite will, your house after it's all over with because, well, I hope they won't. Because you listen to this DVD, you listen to Rodney Balance, you will be able to make preparations for your household in light. Well, let's find out. What is, the, what is the solution? Now, Rodney, my solution to everybody would be, because I've known this for years, since the elite have been giving me information for such a long period of time, uh, I a long time ago got out of debt. I don't owe a penny to a credit card company. I don't owe a penny on, on, on anything, house, uh, automobile, boat, anything. I don't have a boat. But I don't own a penny on any of those things. I, I, I listened to what the elite had to say for me years ago. And I got a paid-for roof over our head. Uh, and I listened to Psalms, the Bible, chapter 15 and verse 5, where it talks about, here it is, let me read it to you if I may, God's holy word. Now, this is not Lindsay Williams speaking. This is God's holy word speaking. He that putteth not out his money to usury, no, usury is interest, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doth these things shall never be moved. Right. You won't be moved out of your house if you don't have any interest on it because you don't have a payment. Well, can I interject a little bit here uh, about debt? Because there's a lot of folks who really strive and desire to be out of debt. They're in a situation of years of maybe um, mishandling money or not understanding how to make it work for them. Whatever the situation has been, maybe just uh, falling on hard times, that they are uh, battling with debt-related issues. They have a mortgage, and, and even though we all want to live debt-free and to have a paid-for roof over our heads, maybe they can't. Maybe we can't do that. I'd like to offer up some suggestions to you. First of all, is in an ebook I've written, and I want to make that ebook available for free to everybody who watches this DVD. I want to give that gift to your viewers. So if you come to financialleadership.co, I want to give you that gift of the seven indisputable laws of financial leadership. The number one law of, of uh, financial leadership is maintaining access to and control over your money. Now, that's not saying you're, you're completely out of debt because many people cannot see themselves being out of debt in the short term. It's just not feasibly possible. What we can do is transform your monetary system, your economic system, to a point to where you have more money accessible to you and less that you're sending to other people. That's a step in the right direction, wouldn't you say, Chaplain? Yes. 
You know, you may not be able to just flip a switch and be debt free, but there are systems in place that can help you get there. And part of that is recognizing who your money is working for. You see, your money is either at rest or it's at work. We need to identify if it's working. Who is it working for? Is it working for that credit card company or that bank? Or is your money working for you? If your money's working hard for you, you don't have to work so hard for your money. Plain and simple. So I want to help people understand how to get to the point you tell them they need to be by understanding how the financial tools work to get them there. Because if, if you tell somebody to uh, hop in their car and to drive to you know, some location somewhere and you don't tell them how to start the car, uh, they're going to scramble wondering how, we're, how they're ever going to get there. So let's help you understand how the car works, how to key turns, and how to put it in gear and get you where you need to go. Don't, don't worry that you're not, you can't immediately be prepared to be debt free. Let us help you. Let us help you understand how and, and help you devise a plan to get there. So I appreciate you letting me interject that there. Uh, and one quick example. So many entertainers and banks want you to understand that you need to have a 15-year mortgage instead of a 30-year mortgage. I totally disagree with that on a large scale. Now remember, everybody's situation is completely different. Some people that may be the right thing for. But using the first of the seven financial indispu the indisputable laws of financial leadership, having access to and control over your money, you have to remember that sending extra money to the bank is removing access to and control over your money from you and giving it to the bank. Should things occur the way that we anticipate them occurring in the financial system coming to a, uh, a slowdown or a screeching halt, whichever it may be, would it be more advantageous to you to owe three more years on a 15-year mortgage and not be able to pay it because you've obligated 40% more per month to the bank and let them foreclose on it, giving all that equity to them. They sell it and, then, and they profit all of, all of your equity. You're out on the street paying the same amount in rent that you would have had to pay if you'd have had a 30-year mortgage. Never obligate more to someone else than you have to. If you were to take the difference between a 30-year mortgage and a 15-year mortgage, put it into something working for you, earning interest for you, I guarantee you, you can have that same mortgage paid off in this, the same amount of time or less than the 15, but you maintain control over and access to that money all along the way. The people who have control over and access to their money will always prevail during challenging economic times. And just I'm going to wrap this up very quickly, but uh, I've, I've helped many people who were sending extra money to the bank for, to pay off their mortgage to redirect that money to where it's earning interest for them. And when challenging economic times occurred, they were prepared. But more importantly, some, one gentleman in particular comes to my mind in California. He, he saw our DVD the last time we did this. And we saved him $1,600 a month. He saved almost $1,000 on his mortgage alone because we changed things around for him from a 15 to a 30. He owed 12 years on that 15-year mortgage when we did this. We restructured his, his, his personal economy, and he'll have enough now in his what I call alternate equity fund to pay that house off in less than 10 years instead of the 12 he still owed on a 15-year mortgage because he redirected the difference between the 15 and the 30 to something working for him. Now, when things happen, problems occur, he has access to that money instead of having to go to the bank and try to borrow it. And what's the one thing you need when you borrow money from a bank, chaplain? A job, right? So if you've lost your job, you don't have access to the equity to begin with. Just a little tidbit that of one thing that these entertainers and banks try to teach you, uh, but remember, these folks aren't... Uh, they're not looking out for your best interest. They're looking out for theirs. Do I, do I have time to talk about the, the bank and the restaurant? No. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, w the one thing that a bank and a restaurant has in common, a restaurant only has a certain number of tables they can sit people at, and that's how they make their money. If they don't make any money until somebody gets up and frees up a table so somebody else can come down and sit that table and order another meal. That's how they make their profit. A bank is the same way. They only have so much money they can loan out. So they need to devise ways to convince you to pay more back to them as soon as possible 
so they can loan it out to someone else. They're making your money work hard for them so they don't have to work so hard for their money. We've got to turn this around. When you understand how banks make money, you put that to work for you the same way. Your money's working hard for you instead of for the bank. Thank you for allowing me that opportunity to share that. It's so important for people to understand that just because these one-size-fits-all people are trying to sell them this, this philosophy, it may not be right for them. And they can contact us and we'll teach them how it works. I was so afraid that for three months I didn't do a radio talk show. The next item is one of the reasons why. Please jot it down. Fear. F E. A R. The elite right now, no, no, you will not hear them tell you this. You won't hear a one of the wealthy tell you this. I heard it. The elite today are attempting every way humanly possible to instill fear in every person on the face of the earth. The other day we had a holiday. And oh my goodness, it was over all the newscast. New York, Washington, supposed to have a terrorist attack. Other cities in America, beware. More police on the street. Stay home. Terrorist attack. I said to my wife and my son, there's not going to be any terrorist attack. I said, it's every bit of fear tactic. The elite today, and they do control the government. They control every congressman up there. There are few they control a little bit less than they do others, fortunately. But if a congressman's been in Congress for over two terms, well, I'll tell you later on what I beg of you to do with them. We'll get to that later. They are, they are under the control and the, and the power and, and under the domination financially of the elite, and the elite are distilling every way possible. Rodney, you do a lot of flying and traveling around the country on aircraft. What are you seeing in the air? We are being treated like criminals in the airports of the United States of America. I have, I'm a pilot. I've flown, I flew for over 30 years commercially. Uh, I have an instrument rating, commercial rating. Uh, I have an aircraft mechanics license. I have flown over 5,000 hours piloting in the command. Back about two years ago, I said, I'll never get on another commercial airliner. I said, I will not be treated like a criminal in my own country. And, and let them make me strip my clothes off and, and look at me uh, like I'm uh, some person to take off my shoes. I said, I will not have that uh, mentality instilled in me. The elite today, they have let me know they intend to instill all the fear they possibly can in the every person imaginable. Rodney, you travel through a lot of airports. What are you seeing? How do you feel when you go through there? 